Hi everybody, this is Caitlin Albright, Education Coordinator, and today I am very excited to be joined by Pittsburgh-based artist and activist Vanessa German. Welcome, Vanessa. Hi, thanks for having me. It's good Thank to be here. For being here. So why don't we just jump right in and how about you tell us a little bit about your background in the arts? Were you always interested in the arts? Uh, what did you study? Tell us a little bit about that. So I grew up in Los Angeles, California. I'm the daughter of a mother who was a fiber artist, but more importantly, like my mother made her name as a fiber artist, as a quilter, but more importantly, she was um, a full bodied artist, which means my mother didn't, my mother crafted our entire lives from the time that we were children, um, like very young around the capacity that we have as fully authorized human beings with creative agency. So I grew up always making things. I grew up with a mother who made our clothes. We made scrunchies for our hair. We made stuffed animals. We made dolls. We made stuff in the backyard. So I grew up, one, um, really invested in that physical process of transforming materials and making stuff. And we made stuff for our lives. We made stuff that um, held our family together. We made stuff that we wore on our body. So as a child, I understood that it wasn't just something relegated to crayons and after school arts and craft classes, but that you could actually, for your whole life, you could actually make the substance of your life. And I also, as a child, understood and learned through the process of making things, like just thinking about what happens to you when you're coloring or when you're drawing a picture, how time shifts and how your focus is centered on this creative, this creative activity. Um, well, as a child, I found that a, a place of peace and refuge. The, the space of actually spending the time making something was really beautiful and peaceful and a space of triumph and revelation for me even as a child and I got the same thing from reading and the same thing from writing poetry and I realized that because um, I grew up in Los Angeles in the 1980s so I grew up around a lot of drugs a lot of gang violence a lot of fires you know there was always something on fire in the neighborhood um, but I also grew up really um, able to be strange and sort of like wacky creative uh, black girl because my mother uh, centered our lives around art and centered our lives around activism and centered our lives around creativity. That's fantastic. Just really quickly. So I um, am a, but otherwise in my practice, I'm a self-taught artist. I did not, I don't have any degrees except those ones I got from my mother. That's fantastic, and those are just as important because you've clearly spent your entire life studying that and integrating it into your life in so many different ways. And I think it's really important to give just as much attention and respect to that type of artistic education and practice as a degree. It's really important because a lot of times I meet people who do not feel validated in their humanity and in their ideas because some external power has not. Um, sort of waved the wand over them and said, you are now an artist, you are now this, you are now that. And there are so many human beings whose attention we could be drawn to who don't have pieces of paper. Among them are just the richest men in the world, like Bill Gates, no paper. He doesn't, he left Stanford um, because he had ideas and he had energy, right? And so, but what I will also say is I live in Pittsburgh, the city of, the city of August Wilson. August Wilson, won Tonys and Pulitzers and is considered like uh, one of the great American playwrights. And he dropped out of school when he was in the seventh grade because a teacher um, accused him of plagiarizing a paper he wrote because it was so good and it was so beautiful. But what August Wilson did was he took up, a, he took up the study of words and of poetry and of story himself just through the library and information is available and it's free and it's in libraries it's in conversations that you have with people so 
that's really something, just um, the last thing I'll say about study and about gaining the ingredients that becomes your artistic, um, that become part of your artistic toolbox is one of the other things that I did was I found people who were creating the art that was interesting to me that had skills that I needed to learn and I just put myself in close proximity to them and I learned by doing. I teched for photographers. I asked artists a lot of questions um, and I got an education dimensionally. I got an education uh, intellectually, spiritually, hands-on and I'm living proof and my career is living proof of the power of that self-directed, self-motivated um, a really loving, forgiving, compassionate form of education where what you're doing is you're following the sparks of inspiration. And I like the, my sustainable life, the life that I have that sustains me as an artist is because of that. It's because of my mama. That's amazing. And I love how beautifully you said that you're following the sparks of inspiration. And that's something that I, I hope all of our young viewers are really taking to heart right now, because there are so many different ways to learn about art and be involved in it. And there's so much value in, and wisdom in everything that you just said. Now, um, I'd love to talk a little bit about when you exhibited at the Eferson a few years back, you created a power figure series that is still talked about to this day. Can you tell us a little bit about that body of work? How did you develop this idea for power figures? What are they? What do they represent to you? So one of the most impactful works of art that I was introduced to um, in my elementary school years was the terracotta army um, in China. And I was really blown away by the massive scale of that work and how individualized each figure was. And they say that there are, well, one, there are still rooms and rooms and rooms of the army that they can't open up because the air itself destroys the pigment on some of the figures and they don't have the technology yet to be able to um, conserve what's there. But it was really impressive to me that human beings did that, that human beings crafted of the earth, of clay, of all of these figures with different facial expressions and different clothes and horses and animals and and it was buried in the ground so for me as like a third grader i was like the most amazing thing in the world was buried in the ground in China. so um that has stuck with me that that uh that that internal sense of being struck with awe and wonder and sort of like hit by this sort of visual um, sensorial arrest with a work of art. And that's something that I sort of gradually came to the recognition that I could create an incarnation of, of a work like that. So that's one thing. And then um, central to my life is uh, the work of, of uh, really investing deeply um, and dimensionally and soulfully into, um, into the nature, into the ecosystem of my humanity. So investing deeply, soulfully, um, courageously into the ecosystem of my humanity means that I'm deeply concerned with freedom. And being concerned with freedom in the United States as a black, queer, overweight uh, woman uh, means that you, you're an activist, whether or not you want to be an activist, because someone with my body and my mother's body and my father's body, we were never in the imagination of the people who created the United States of America. We were never supposed to be free and we were never supposed to have resources. We were never imagined to be at a place where we had the power and authority over our own bodies. So being that I'm concerned with freedom and I want to experience as much freedom and liberty as I can courageously, lovingly experience while I'm alive, um, I don't wanna regret. I don't wanna get to be age 76 and say, I wish I had made art even though I was scared and everybody told me this. I don't, I'm not trying to live a life like that. 
And so being concerned with freedom and liberty, the soul's right to breathe, means that you must actively confront that which is trying to prevent you from having freedom and liberty. And so I've done a lot of protests, I've been in the street, but one of the things that I recognize happens to me in the process of making art is that I'm better. My mind is clearer, my imaginational, my, my um, the sort of engineering of my imagination is both wilder, but also clearer, and I'm able to focus and contend with the trauma, because um, it's a really traumatic experience to keep always pressing against and pushing back on somebody who's trying to come down on your breath and your life is, as we know, like it's really traumatic to constantly be saying, I'm real, I'm whole, I'm human, don't talk to me like that, I am a whole human being. Um, so what I started to do in that body of work was really think about Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote about how you cannot, you could kill liars every day of the week, you just keep killing people who lie but it doesn't kill the lie. How do you kill a lie? And so in my creative practice, because I'm more focused and my ideas are clearer and there's part of my engineering, um, like high functioning technical part of my brain that's sharper in my creative process, I began to really consider what tools of our humanity, and I, th I think of their mess, I think of uh, things like as technologies, I call it the uh, human technology and technology of the soul. Like what things really kill lies? And I thought, well, patience kills a lie and love kills a lie and um, grace kills lies and forgiveness will kill lies and consuming a space with lies, with truth will kill lies. And so what I did was I began to make an entire army of black uh, feminized uh, like female power figures that are each weapons in and of themselves and that the weapons are activated by sight or by experiencing them. So even if people didn't know, so there were 31 figures in the army and I called it an army and the installation that was at the Everson is called I Come to Do Violence to the Lie. And I um, endowed and imbued inside of each one of those power figures a bunch of secret ingredients, like there's a bunch of text inside some of the uh, of the beads that hang off of the power figures. Um, there's sheets of music. There's old uh, like hair weave hair. There's all of these secret ingredients um, inside of those figures that activate those individual powers. And among them are the powers of creativity, um, the power of love, the power of expressing rage without doing destruction to your own physical body or to somebody else's physical body. That idea that we can be in conflict without destroying one another is, it is uh, one of the tools that can do a violence to the lie. So for me, that body of work is dimensional. It works for me and it matters. Like you matter in your practice, right? You can make artwork that pleases you, it's fine. And so part of me, uh, part of the work of the violence, the army doing violence to the lie, it's doing that work for me. It's doing that work so that I can be more free and that I can be more loving and more courageous while I'm on the planet. And it is activated by sight and by experience, even if people don't know the individual powers of each power figure, though there's a list, it exists. Um, but be engaging with it in and of itself, the curiosity of looking through all of the different objects, because it's mixed media sculpture. There's a ton of different objects in the entire army, and even the adventure of curiosity of wondering why. Why are there so many mirrors? Why are there light bulbs? Why are there very distinct colors, red, white, blue, black, and gold? Even following a path of curiosity activates the power of the power figures and it activates that power in the simultaneity of time so we know through physics that time is one plane um, so that has the power to be active in the simultaneity of time
That's incredible. And being able to actually experience these figures in person, I will say, is such a, an amazing experience. And um, I know it's the one that we have in our collection still. All of the school tours that come through here, they always have to stop and they're just in awe of it. Like they really do take on such a life and such a presence. And you can truly feel that kind of power and spirit coming through 